I just really love a feel from you as to how you see the whole debate about climate warming, um, human activity, uh, the contribution that it is making. I ask that because we're endlessly told there's a complete uh, consensus among scientists and yet many of the tipping points that the activists tell us are going to happen have actually not happened or have not been as catastrophic as we were told. So we, we, I think many of us are still saying, can we get a really clear and authoritative steer on the science and on the modelling? I'd just be interested in your general views. John, a pleasure to chat on that topic uh, and others. And I might say, um, uh, thanks for that question. How long have we got? Uh, <laughs> we could go into a lot of detail. Um, let me just say something first about science and the role of uh, science. Um, because I think a lot of people uh, get the idea that science sorts it out. We know what's right, what's wrong, uh, we can predict things, uh, etc. And of course, uh, to some extent, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, there are some things that are pretty certain, which is if I looked at this table where we've got two glasses of water and I uh, tip the thing over, there's a pretty good chance that water's going to end up on the floor. Uh, there's not much of a chance, although it's theoretically possible, that it could all disappear out a crack uh, in the door over, over a few metres uh, away from us. So there are, of course, some things that are a lot more certain than others. But science, at the end of the day, isn't in the business of being right or wrong or truth or false or inconvenient truths or untruths uh, as the case may be. Science is about working hypotheses which we use in our daily lives to help understand, to help improve things and to help sometimes give us an indication of what's coming around the corner. And these working hypotheses if they're no longer fit for purpose, we just discard them and come up with another one. Newton had an apple supposedly fall on his head and figured out uh, some laws of uh, gravitation. Einstein came up with a relativity that really said, Newton, you've got it wrong, good sir. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that. It doesn't stop us even now using Newtonian physics to predict how something is going to fall if you drop it from the Leaning Tower of Pisa or what have you. And will it hit the ground at the same time? Will a stone ball hit the ground the same time as a glass ball or whatever? So we've got to put things into this context that when a chief medical officer or a scientist stands up and says, we're all agreed this is where it's heading, draw air between teeth a little bit and say, well, just remember, you're basing that on hypotheses, which may or may not be particularly useful and may or may not get improved as we get more data and understanding. So this is a very long-winded way, by way of openers, of saying this is never black and white. It is never solved. Even if 999 out of 1,000 say, yep, that's where we're heading. So then when I come to the actual modelling of forward climate, I find that the modelling itself uh, tends to be the agreement between different models is somewhat all over the place, point one. Point two, if we go back to 1850 or so and look at CO2 just steadily rising, steadily rising, up and down every season, I might add, uh, of course, we know that, um, but also, uh, and visible, by the way, in the atmosphere. There is no doubt that you can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere that's come from fossil fuels. It's got a different isotopic uh, ratio uh, to CO2 that's up in the upper uh, atmosphere. So steadily rising, and yet temperature hasn't steadily risen. It's gone up, level, down a bit, up, down a bit, up over 10 to 15 year type periods. Yet our driver has gone steadily up and our models say it goes steadily up, not up, down, up, pause, whatever. So there's something here in our modeling that should alert us to the fact that whilst we know a lot about it, and certainly our short term weather forecasting these days is very, very good, um, 
we're actually nowhere near the 100% level. So that being the case, I urge a little bit of caution about the alarmist side. If you're relying on the models only, your justification to me is not so strong. I'm not saying don't do anything. That's a very different uh, discussion. I find that valuable because no, you're not arguing and I'm not arguing for complacency. That's different. But if we... Or, or denial, John. Or uh, denial. We're not denying. No, no. No, no. As I said, you can measure fossil fuel CO2 in the atmosphere mm. and it is increasing. And there we know no doubt. too. And even, it has an impact. And even before that, in my field, in agriculture, farming practices have been releasing carbon we know for centuries. Um, and that's anthropological activity that's been releasing carbon. But the point is, we need to be calm and avoid catastrophism. Catastrophism rarely solves a problem, uh, it seems to me. So we need to be measured and flexible and calm. I think there are so many ways that we can take a sane approach, a balanced approach, uh, we can say, because we don't know all of the detail of how the future will unfold, it behoves us for generations to come, even those living now, to tread carefully. And tread carefu treading carefully does mean making alterations. But should we go overboard on one particular brand A or brand B or one particular option. And that seems to me to be not a smart way to go because what we know is that if there's a broad will to make change, and we see that in Australia, we've signed on for zero by 2050, uh, both sides and all states, uh, et cetera, have done that. If we see that there's a broad will it's pretty hard to say that any one particular path is going to get us there faster with less negative impacts as well as positive uh, impacts as others. So you actually do need a range of activities going on that will then deliver you to the path. And if you find that uh, the things that you choose to be your preferred paths are having no impact, uh, heaven forbid, but if that's what you find, well then of course you change the paths that you're on. But all I would remind, uh, not that you need reminding of it, John, um, innovation is path dependent. The more you get into something, the more you learn, the more opportunities open up and away you go. It's very, very hard to say, pick this path because I know and 999 out of a thousand also think they know. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe, and join the conversation.